Okay, we're going to dive right into this. I love talking about hormone optimization, and I have a legit hormone optimization expert. So, Morella, the first thing I wanted to talk about is gut health, because without gut health, there is no hormone optimization. What do you think a lot of people get wrong about gut health? I think people have normalized having gut issues as if it's just, it's just normal. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the first things I ask ladies when they come to me is like they have, you know, they fill out the form and I start going through and, you know, the first thing they say is, oh, I don't have any gut health issues. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, and then they have this laundry list of things that's wrong with them. Right. And, right. you know, and I'm trying to explain to them, you know, without gut health and without liver health, we can't even start talking hormone health. Absolutely. Because, at, you know, at the end of the day, um, if your gut is not functioning well, if your liver is not functioning well, there's no way you're going to ever achieve hormone health. Right. So, you know, that's one of the first things that we talk about. And, you know, and I don't know where some of their uh, logic or some of the information, because, I mean, you and I both know the trash is information that's out there. And, oh. you know, uh, with regards to what's normal. And normal has become this word that, you know, just everyone accepts as, as, you know, oh, I'm 50. That's normal. Oh, I'm a woman through going through menopause. That's normal. You know, and when I say to them, you know, you don't, that doesn't have to be you. You don't have to, you know, having bloating, having all this issues with like, you know, um, digestion where you, you needing to run to have a Tums or, you know, or you're not going to the bathroom and they'll say to, oh, you know, and one of the first things that I say is, well, you know, let's get a little personal here and it's like, how many times do you go to the bathroom? And they'll say, oh, you know, every other day or, you know, which is normal for me. Yeah. And I'll say, well, how many times a day do you eat? Right. And they'll say, well, on average three times, maybe a couple snacks here and there. And I said, well, you know, you multiply that by two days or even three days because some of them say two, three days. And yeah. I say like, think about all that waste that is inside, you know, and you're complaining about bloat and like all that is sitting inside, like going every other day or every two, three days is not normal. Oh, but you know, I Googled it and they said for some people it is normal. <laughs> and I'm like, who is putting this stuff out there? Like, I just don't get it. So well, I'll interject a funny, I'll interject a funny story here. There's a guy that I was watching on YouTube. He was vegan for many years and then he decided to go on the carnivore diet. So now it's a hundred percent meat. And he was saying that the, one of the benefits of this diet is that he doesn't have to go to the bathroom that often. He said he goes every several days. Now he's framing this as if it's a benefit. And his, his interpretation was that the food he's eating is so full of nutrition that there isn't any waste, all right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the kind of nonsense that people propagate. Now there's so yeah. much information being promulgated as you just mentioned that for the average person who's busy, they got other things going on, they got a career, they got a family, they don't have time to go through all the research like we do and read all the yeah. books that we've read and attend the courses that we have. So it's easy to fall into these traps. And that's yeah. one of them. So now someone is saying that going to the bathroom every couple of days is not only normal, it's healthy, and it's a sign that his food is of high quality. It's so <laughs> stupid. It's the most moronic <laughs> stuff you can put out there. But this is the problem now because someone like the customer you're talking about, clients rather, is going to go, oh, okay, so I'm normal too. But I mean, if you're eating every day, you've got to eliminate every day. Exactly. I mean, drink, yeah. Imagine if you're drinking a lot of water and you never have to urinate. What, no oh. one would think that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that, that would have to be like, you know, for me, the most frustrating thing is when we're trying to, because the first thing they want to do is like, okay, well, fix me. Like, you know, uh, right. I'm not sleeping. You know, I'm having um, all these uh, issues with regards to my hormones, you know, hot flashes and night sweats. And, you know, what can you give me for my hormones? And I so, said, like, can we just back up a little bit? Because let's talk about, you know, what's your diet consist of? What's your daily activity consist of? What's your lifestyle in general? You know, like, are you one of these people that are grabbing, you know, lunch on the go while you're like, you know, you're in the car driving the kids and, you know, all these things affect your digestion, affect how you, you know, uh, your food just simulates and how you uh, absorb it. And you, you're probably not even absorbing your nutrients at this point if your gut health is that poor, you know, and that's the other thing. It's like, you know, it's uh, this whole thing. We are what we eat. No, we are what we can absorb, you know? And so many of us go through life just thinking that, you know, oh, we're eating, you know, all this healthy food. But if, it, if you're still feeling like crap, there's the problem with the, you know, absorption of the nutrients. There's, right. They're not going to where they need to be going. 
And, you know, and then with regards to your liver, you know, um, and hormones, I always say, you know, it, the two work in hand in hand, you know, so, you know, your liver is working hard to get rid of all the excess estrogen and all the garbage that you put into it. But if it gets to your gut and you're not eliminating, it gets unpacked and back, you know, it recirculates. So now you've given your liver so much more. And if you throw alcohol on top of that, your liver is going to say, well, you know what, estrogen number two or three times you've been by here, you, I'm going to park you over here because I'm going to deal with the alcohol, this toxin that keeps coming into me, you know, <laughs> to clear it out. Because it, you know, let's face it, alcohol is a toxin. And, yeah. you know, I, and I'm not against, you know, having a glass of wine with dinner, or we go out with friends. But I'm talking about the people who need to have alcohol to unwind. And I hear that a lot. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I have a very stressful job, the kids and everything, and I have a glass or two a night. Yeah. That's what I have a problem with, yeah. you know, because let's let's deal with all that so that you're not reaching for that, you know, kind of glass of wine. <laughs> at That's night. One of the biggest problems with alcohol is the stress that it impacts on the liver. And then yeah. that has a, a domino effect of now your liver has to focus on dealing with all the toxicity from the alcohol you're eating and it can't clear out the environmental things, the heavy metals that are naturally in food. Now your liver is weak. I mean, the weaker your liver is, the more of a negative impact it's going to have everywhere. Yeah. And I, I don't think people realize how unhealthy alcohol is. And like you, I'll have a drink every once in a while, and I'm not telling people they need to cut it out completely, but there is no healthy dose of alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. glass, according to Dr. Mark Gordon, of any serving of alcohol. And he's a big alcohol guy himself, ironically, but he doesn't have any illusions about alcohol. Just one yeah. serving of alcohol just shuts off your testosterone and growth hormone for 24 hours. And that's just one drink. Now imagine... Wow that's having a couple seven days a week yeah yeah maybe your body adapts over time i don't know that's the other interesting thing because with marijuana if, if you do it infrequently it has a negative impact on hormones but if you do it frequently your body adapts and then it doesn't yeah. have such a negative impact yeah. it may be something similar with alcohol but because of the negative impact on the liver i, I can't yeah. imagine that that would be the case i think it was just yeah. eventually it's going to be a problem yeah, and I think, you know, and I think this could probably be that illusion that we live under because our bodies are great machines. And I always say this, you know, we have the most smart, you know, beautiful machines that are our bodies. And, you know, and we abuse them because they're able to adapt, you know, and give us this illusion of that everything's okay. Right. You know, so you go two, three days, you may feel like crap, whatever. And then it kind of balances out and it kind of gets you back to, you know, now you think, oh, I'm fine. You know, yeah. but it's that little bit increments, little increments, little increments that you're adding on to, whether it's toxins or just your your bad diet or you know your lifestyle that just accumulates and accumulates over time. And you know what always gets me is you know when someone gets diagnosed, you know, with a, a serious condition, and people say, "Oh my God, it came out of nowhere," right. you know. Right. <laughs> you know, and I always say, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. And this, right. he didn't wake up one morning and all of a sudden cancer decided to like appear. Like these are just accumulations of things that we do on a daily basis that eventually the body just says, I can't. Right. And, you know, it, it just so, yeah, it, it's, it just amazes me how people don't correlate their gut health with yeah. everything else that's going on because, yeah. it, you know, and, and I, I admittedly, I was one of them like for years, you know, like a good 50 plus years of my life before I started this, uh, what I started this when I was 51, really it started when I, you know, started to really notice I'm not feeling good. I need to do something. Right. So, you know, you figure the first 50 years of my life, I was eating your regular standard American diet with regards to, you know, meats and dairy and all that. And drinking the alcohol and thinking that I was fine, you know that. But um, so it it, uh, it it was a wake up call for me in that. Um, but thankfully, it wasn't because of a grave condition, right? It was just I was going through perimenopause and it just hit me like a brick wall. Yeah. And I thank God for that, really, because it, it kind of put me into this trajectory now that I'm able to help other people because right. I've helped myself, right? And I often think that because I've gone through it myself and I know what it's like to have the hot flashes, I know what it's like to the, the foggy memory and 
just the, the feeling of unwell, you know, waking up in the morning with no energy, right. you know, and, and thinking that I was doing everything right. Well, I'm going to the gym and I'm eating this and I'm eating that. And, you know, just not taking care of my gut health first. Honestly, that was like, you know, the biggest eye opener for me. Yeah. What do, what do you do to start rejuvenating gut health with people? I'm sure it varies with each person, but are there any general steps, initial recommendations that are pretty universal? Yeah, we, we look at the diet as a whole of what they're currently doing. And I don't try to, because a lot of them aren't, like a lot of people that come to me aren't vegan or plant-based, right? And my program is 100% plant-based, but that doesn't mean that, you know, overnight I expect them to do that because it took me six months to make the full transition into a plant-based diet. So, you know, we start with pretty much the known stressors. So for me, dairy tends to be at the top of that list. So I look at what they're doing with regards to dairy, you know, and we try to eliminate, you know, something in, in that uh, category. So if they're having, you know, uh, dairy milk every day, I try to say, can we try to switch to a plant, you know, um, milk? And we start with that. Then, you know, I look at what they're doing as far as, um, you know, their lifestyle. I say, is there something here? You know, are they getting any kind of movement? Um, because that's so important too for our microbiome, right? Yeah. What are you doing as far as, you know, um, so they say, oh, you know, I don't get out. I don't get to a gym. I say, you don't need to go to a gym. You know, I'll, I didn't go to gym for years. You know, I did all my workouts at home and you don't need to all of a sudden start with a regimen of an hour. You know, I said, can you do 15 minutes, you know? So we start slow and then uh, from there we progress to, you know, their sleeping habits and, and their eating habits and what they're doing because all that affects digestion, you know? So um, we say, you know, like, can you sit down for your meals? You know, because, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, breakfast, I just grab a coffee and I go, right. you know, and coffee is another one that, you know, uh, for years I just did the coffee thing and I thought, yeah. you know, coffee's fine. And there's nothing wrong with coffee and I don't, <laughs> You know, people always come down with me, you know, what's wrong with coffee? <laughs> um, you know, coffee is one of those things that, you know, one a day, you know, in the morning, uh, but it's when you're having it that, you know, are you having it the minute you wake up and you're stumbling down to the coffee maker to have that coffee? You know, and I'll try to say to them, look, you know, and I try to explain the, the effects of how that artificially raises their art cortisol and how it's going to mess up their entire day when it comes to, you know, their hunger cues and all that. So I said, okay, let's make a deal. You can have your coffee, but can we just push it back to after your breakfast? You know, oh, I don't eat breakfast. So again, you know, that's another <laughs> signal for me that I say, okay, we need to start, you know, priming you and regulating you so that we can start getting your calories in in a more um, a consistent basis. So your body knows when to expect and we're not having these huge dips in blood sugar, right? So we start to do that. Um, so, you know, like I said, not everybody comes from um, a point of, they, they all want, they know what they want the end result to be, but a lot of people don't want, don't realize that there's steps and the work that has to be done. Yeah. And if they realize it, a lot of people aren't willing to do it. And yeah. it, it amazes me how, okay, well, you're here, you're feeling like absolute, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't have come to me in the first place if you didn't. And yet to get you from here to where you want to be, to where you're optimally should be, it's going to take work and it's going to take some changes and it's going to, so building habits is what I try to do, stacking habits with them, you know, just, you know, I've been, you know, wake up in the morning, can we do a glass of water, you know, and, and get you to, you know, do your thing, do your, you know, so it, it depends on the client, but yeah, just getting them to slowly realize that, you know, their, their habits that they currently have might have to change, removing some of the known stressors, like I said, dairy, first off, foremost, removing that coffee first thing in the morning, trying to see if we can get them to, you know, optimize their cortisol and all that. Um, you know, getting them to eat a more nutrient dense diet that, you know, uh, and it's balanced because like I said, a lot of them don't even have breakfast. So we try to, you know, can you do an oatmeal with berries and maybe, you know, 
uh, a healthy fat in there, you know, just so that, you know, come 11 o'clock, you're not reaching for that donut that's at the office, you know. Right. So, yeah. so you know, just um, and a lot, you know, or making those overnight oats. If you're tired, you know, a lot of women say, I don't have time in the morning, you know, between making the kids breakfast and running out the door. I'll say, okay, well, you know, do you have one hour at night to prep your meals for the next day, you know? Or do you have a Sunday that you can take a couple hours? You know, because let's face it, if we don't prep and we don't make time, we're bound to fail. You know, we're bound not to be able, you know, and similarly, when you go grocery shopping, you know, go with a list so that, you know, you hit those, you know, get all the things that you need to get and you stop wandering in the aisles and kind of just grabbing the ready-made stuff because, you know, it's convenient. You know, and a lot of ladies, you know, it's um, they're working moms or, you know, they they're in that sandwich era, you know, where they have their elderly parents or the kids are away at uni and, you know, or in high school and they're having to responsibilities between the two. Right. So it's just, in my opinion, making yourself a priority, which a lot of women don't. Right. And, um, you know, just having a plan. You know, like anything in life, start with a plan, start with where, you know, your day is going to look like. So, you know, if if I'm a big uh, diary, like, you know, like every day, even at night, I, I make it things of what I need to do the next day. So it's like I love checklists and I know not everybody's like that, uh. but at least it gives me like preparation for the next day. And, you know, I go to bed and I'm not like, you know, going through a million things. Oh, my God, you know, what's tomorrow going to look like? Because no, now I planned it. You know, my overnight oats are in the fridge. So I know in the morning I can get up, have my water, you know, get ready, have my overnight oats, head to the gym or do my workout, whatever, you know, that order is for you. But I find that, um, you know, it's just teaching people habits that they can stack one on top of the other. And that's how we start, you know, so we start with removing things and then slowly implementing. And my philosophy is let's crowd out um, stuff rather than take away. Because the minute you say to someone, I want you to stop eating meat, fish, you know, eggs, chicken, they freak out. right? (laughs) So even though the meals I give them are all plant based, I say, you know, in place of the, say, the lentils or the tofu, you know, you can still have. You know, because they say, oh, you know, I, I can't give up my chicken or my fish or my, oh. I said, okay, but okay. we're going to divide your plate. And, you know, I teach them what their plate should look like, you know, so I'll say, let's do this. Let's, you know, now, uh, you know, have your plate be, you know, nice green cruciferous vegetables or, you know, uh, a quarter, let's do, you know, some a protein. If you can't do anything other than your chicken or fish or meat right now, that's fine. We'll do that. And then the other quarter is going to be a complex carb, you know. So at least it gives them a visual and we start there. And I figure that if I start implementing more veggies, eventually that, you know, source of protein, that chicken, whatever will go and they'll be more into the lentils. And yeah, you're using that crowding out philosophy. I like that because instead of taking things away, you're just adding a lot of things in and eventually yeah. that pushes the stuff that you want out over time. Exactly. It does it seamlessly where it doesn't seem like such a daunting task. I really like the overnight oats too. I think that's a great option for anyone who's busy because you make oh. it, you can stack it with tons of nutrition. You can put pumpkin seeds in there, blueberries, put Not- some, um, milk, whatever you can just put spices cinnamon etc you can just stack it so that it's ready to pull out of the fridge the next morning exactly. and it isn't one of the benefits of overnight oats the fact that it increases resistant starch yes the health pool, the yeah. give you pre more prebiotics to fuel the probiotics isn't that an additional benefit yeah, yeah absolutely so overnight oats has so many i mean uh for women there was one lady who actually came to me and her cholesterol was quite high yeah. So just by changing her breakfast and adding overnight oats to her breakfast, and um, she saw like within the 30 day plan that I gave her, she came back to me. She said, my cholesterol numbers are fantastic. She said, I'm sleeping at night. I'm going to the bathroom every day, <laughs> you know, and she was shocked. And yeah. she said, and just as a cherry on top, she said, I lost, I lost 15 pounds. Uh, and she didn't do anything above and beyond exercise wise. So what we did was rather than take out 
her like entire diet as it was, I basically did that. I said, you know, we're going to switch out your breakfast, but you know, instead of having, you know, all this pasta and whatever, let's stick some more veggies in there. I said, you can still have some pasta. I said, but I want you to be, look at your plate, make more of it to be these veggies, you know? And yeah, she was astounded how she was able to lose 15 pounds. And like I said, her, her exercise routine um, wasn't anything special. She was just walking. Um, she said, I don't have a gym membership. I said, I don't need you to get one. I said, you know what? I said, resistance training at our age is important. I said, but if all you can do for me in 30 days is walk every day, I said, I'll take it. And uh, yeah, so, you know, there are a lot of benefits to um, just walking. And a lot of people think that, you know, I, I need to like go to the gym and do all these weights. And yeah, you know what? It is important, like I said, for our bones and, you know, our muscle as we're getting older, we're losing it at a faster rate and we do need to incorporate it. But, you know, I think that if we're starting from zero, from someone who's never done it, you know, if all you can give me is walking, I'll take it for now, you know, and then slowly we start to incorporate some, you know, even body weight stuff, you know, just grab your kitchen chair, let's do some squats, you know, that kind of stuff. So people sleep on walking. And the thing also is when someone's really overweight, walking is a form of resistance training for them. I mean, for those of, for someone who's not overweight, try putting a 40 pound weight vest on and go for a walk. I mean, it's difficult. It's a form yeah. of resistance training. And also yeah. it's something that is, is replicatable. So you can do it seven days a week. You can go, you can yeah. walk around the block. So it's not one of those things where you're going, uh, I don't know if I have time to get to the gym. I don't know if I want to do a full blown workout, just walk outside, boom, go walk around the block. Maybe yeah. it's a quarter of a mile to start. Then you work up to a mile, then it becomes two miles then it becomes more. I mean, I do two hour walks every day with the dogs and I find that I actually, and that's in addition to lifting weights a couple of times, yeah. a week. but most of the activity is really walking for me seven yeah. days a week. But I find that the walking is so effective for a physique composition, especially when you do that much, 10,000 steps or more every day. I actually have to make sure I'm getting a surplus of nutrition or calories. Otherwise I start dropping too much weight. And that's exactly. just really from the walking because that's a yeah. daily thing. So I think people sleep on walking. They think that it's easy for most people. So it can't be useful other than yeah. just movement, but that's really, that's really erroneous, especially, yeah. especially when you get past an hour. Yeah. And I mean, most of us have sedentary uh, jobs, right? I mean, yeah. we sit at a desk and, you know, beyond the, like you said, the, the, you know, for the weight issue, it's just for our joints, you know, yeah. and just being able to stay mobile, you know? Um, so yeah, no, um, walking is definitely a thing. So yeah, um, to get back to your question with regards to how we start is, yeah, we basically, I start to remove what I know to be the stressors uh, in their diet, uh, dairy being the first one. So, you know, if their consumption of red meat is really high or processed cold cuts and all that, we try to, you know, um, maybe, you know, cut it back. You know, I don't, like I said, I don't like to like take it there you know, <laughs> and uproot their life because, you know, the reality is they also have a husband, most of them and, and kids right. that's still at home. So, yeah. you know, who wants to be preparing a meal for you and then a meal for the rest of the family, yeah. right? So it has yeah. to be something that they can stick to because like I say to all my ladies, I want you not to need me after our time together. That's right. my, my job because if nobody lives off a meal plan, let's face it, yeah. Who the hell wants to live off a meal plan? I don't, <laughs> you know, but my job is to teach you how these um, different foods, what they do for you and, and how you can incorporate them into your life so that, you know, you can make it for your entire family so that you can, you know, enjoy them. And it's not like I'm on a diet because you, I want you to take that word out of your vocabulary. This isn't a start and a finish. This is, I want you to learn something that's a useful tool for the rest of your life. So, you know, I don't want to be living off a, you know, okay, well, what am I supposed to be eating today? So I don't expect anybody else to do that. So if they can learn, uh, you know, how to put a plate together, how to, you know, to get all their, uh, you know, uh, healthy fats and proteins and carbs in, and, and uh, you know, know the nutritional, you know, their vitamins and minerals and all that, then I've done my job, 
you know, and, and if I can teach them, you know, how to better their lifestyle in that, you know, incorporate exercise, incorporate, you know, I'm, I'm big on journaling and meditation and having just, even if it's just, you know, a five minute prayer time that you can just to yourself, like just shut the world out and just, and I think that's so helpful too. And we, and we kind of don't incorporate that into our lives. We're just so busy that we don't take that time for gratefulness and, and just being thankful. And that to me has a huge effect on just your overall outlook on your day, you know? So if you can get up in the morning and just have that few minutes to yourself when everything else is quiet before life happens, that also sets you up for, you know, a nice successful day, you know, because if, if your mindset is in a wake up and you're busy and you're checking your phone and you're running around and you're constantly chasing your tail. So now, you know, you're not going to think, oh, I'm going to, and even if, in my opinion, even if you're eating the right foods, it's not being assimilated in your gut the way it needs to be because of the nervousness and that now everything is just, you know, so I, I, I'm a strong believer in just, you know, take time to eat your meals, be mindful of what you're eating and how you're eating. Um, you know, it's just as important as what you're eating, you know, so. Yeah, I was telling you about a rescue dog I got recently, and he had pretty bad gut issues when we first got him. And he was, was always in this adrenaline-based state initially because he came from a traumatic background, so it took a while for him to acclimate. But you could see the impact of just being in that adrenaline state on gut health very dramatically with him. I mean, he would essentially have diarrhea every day. So when he was in a calm state, he wouldn't. So he had he would have breakfast, he's fine. But then when we would go for a walk, that's just a lot of stimuli is taken in. You know, he may never have gone for a walk ever previously. He was right. rest in Korea. He was chained up most of his life. And then he was trained in someone's home for a while, but he, he wasn't exploring the world the way he is now. So he's taken in a lot of stimuli. And even though it's not necessarily negative, his adrenaline is going through the roof. Absolutely. And it wasn't until he got into a much calmer state over time that his gut health improved. And you could see the difference, you know, literally you could see the difference it made as that adrenaline just started quieting. So you start thinking about how most people start their days with an adrenaline boost. That's what coffee is essentially, especially on an empty stomach. So you're taking a boost of caffeine, right? That's why everyone drinks coffee. People aren't having decaf coffee in the morning. They're having strong caffeinated coffee. So their cortisol goes through the roof, their adrenaline is way up, and then it shuts off your appetite. So you have the illusion of energy is what I say caffeine is. Caffeine is not an energy boost. It's the illusion of energy. You think you have energy, but you're just creating stress. So the stress is giving you the illusion that you have energy. While a healthy meal, such as some of the things you mentioned, that's actually real fuel. Now you're really giving yourself energy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that was one of those. I mean, years ago, I thought that having a coffee and before <laughs> I went to the gym was fantastic. Why? Because... It got me like really jittery. Like, and at one point I got, I remember this so vividly. I got to the gym and my heart must have been going, like, I actually felt it felt like it was coming out of my chest. I thought, what yeah. is wrong with me? <laughs> and i like, no, this coffee thing. And because, you know, people use it as a pre-workout drink, yeah. Yeah. you know, because yeah. like you said, it gives you this false energy. It's really not energy. You're just like, Writing on this. <laughs> You're going to have a good workout. I made a post about these pre-workout supplements that are really heavy in stimulants. Mm -hmm. Caffeine and these, some of them even have methamphetamine type derivative stimulants. But anyway, when you consume one of these and it kicks in, you you think you're going to have a great workout. On the drive over, you're going, man, I can't wait to get there. I'm going to destroy. And then you're going through your warm-up sets and you're already tired. You haven't even yeah. made it to the money sets and you're tired because your blood pressure is through the roof. And I always say your, your blood pressure is going to go up from intense training. So wh why would I want to go in with a very elevated blood pressure to start with? You know, yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. And then I know people, especially in the fitness industry, trainers in particular, that live off of pre-workout drinks and not even for their workouts, just to get through the day because coffee is yeah. not enough anymore. You know, they're sleeping three, four hours a night and then they're taking all these stimulants, which ruins your sleep for the next night. So this just accumulates. I would say that relying on stimulants is like going into credit card debt. Yes. The credit card debt is the illusion that you have money to spend, but you're just racking up debt. And then eventually you're going to have to pay it back with high interest. So eventually, all of these stimulants, no matter how strong they are, at some point, they're not going to work anymore. Your adrenals are going to crash. 
And then it's going to take months, if not longer, to just start feeling normal. You're going to be in this constant state of real fatigue for a long yeah. time. And that's the other thing, you know, um, with regards to time that you just made a good point is, you know, we don't get to this state of health of, you know, um, overnight. Yeah. It takes years of accumulated bad habits and poor eating and alcohol and late nights and, and all that jazz. And yet, you know, we want these miracle cures, right? Yeah. We want like, okay, you know, I should be fine in 30 days. I should be fine. And you know, sometimes yeah. it could take three months, six months, a year, you know, uh, before your body finally gets rid of all these toxins and starts to function properly with the nutrients that now it can assimilate and digest and you know your bowels are happening and everything just starts to work harmoniously but you know don't expect because there are no miracle pills and that's what i tell everyone you know if you want a miracle pill if you want a miracle fix i'm not your gal i i'm very honest that way because i don't want you to come to me and i sell you a program or you know uh, a one-to-one -one and you know within 30 days you're expecting miracles when right. you know yeah. <laughs> you know it yeah. It, it could take months because of the fact that where you are, you know, let's start at your baseline. If your baseline is, you know, down here, I can't get you over here where you're supposed to be like in 30 days. It's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's got to, it's, it's a progression and we, and we work on different parts, right? Because if I throw everything at you, okay, I need your sleep eight, eight hours a day. I need you to drink eight glasses of water a day. I need you to work out. Three times a week i need you to walk every day they turn around and run yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know and because the reality is that, you know we are all instant gratification yeah. beings, i guess humans right 100%. so and and we want what we want without a lot of effort so um i know the people who really want to make the change are those that are like realistic with what you know and they're they're right up front and they'll say to me there's no way i can do that so can we modify it you know and yeah let's modify it let's i want you to be honest with me and tell me what you are willing to do to get there you know if so that we can work together otherwise you know i i can give you the best meal plan i can give you the best advice tell you uh you know what to do for sleep or what supplements to take and but if you're not going to do it, or if you're going to do it half ass, yeah, we might as well not even start, <laughs> you know, because no, don't waste your money. Yeah, it's just a battle of attrition for most people at that point. And every battle of attrition ends the same way. Eventually you lose and you're going to lose yeah. big time. And I think with 30 days, the only goal you should have in 30 days is beginning to build the habits that you're the teaching habits. folks. Yeah. Right? You shouldn't even expect any miraculous results in 30 days. Yeah. If you're actually, if you make it through 30 days implementing these things, that's a big win right there. You make it through 90 days. Now you start starting to see some results over the course of many years. It can be miraculous. And I think yeah. that's when you think about it, a couple of years is really not a long time. No. Especially as you get older, one year is nothing as you get yeah, older. <laughs> years is nothing. Right? <laughs> if you're a teenager, four years is an eternity because you're yeah. a freshman in high school. It's yeah. going to take forever. Yeah. But you're, but you're 15 years old. So four years ago, you were 11. So of course, four yeah. years feels like a long time. Yeah. But so I think that's the other thing too, is that most people market products in terms of 30 days. Here's what you're going to achieve in 30 days because they know how the psychology of the consumer is. Yeah. They need that yeah. instant result. They want to feel something in the first couple of days and then they want miraculous results in 30 days. And you see these 90 day body transformations, but the only time that works is when it's someone that used to be in shape and now they're getting back into shape in 90 days. Someone who's never been in shape and they've been, let's say, 100 pounds overweight their entire life, they've never exercised, they've never engaged in healthy eating, that person's not going to go from that point to looking like one of the guys in the 300 movie in 90 days. It's just not going to happen. It's a ridiculously unrealistic expectation. Now, over the course of several years, it can happen. And when you think about it, if someone told me, look, I'm going to show you how to go from where you were at to exactly where you want to go, in terms of your health, your vitality, your physique, everything, it's going to take three years of dedication. To me, that would be great. Three years is nothing. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times we have to, people have to be retaught reality of change. Reality, absolutely. You're not going to change. You're not going to make a business in 30 days. Imagine if you were saying, telling someone, okay, start your business, and then in 90 days you're going to be making six figures. 
Yeah. Not 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 doing anything legal. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And if you're doing it illegally, it's that you're not going to sustain that, as everyone yeah. who's watching an episode of American Creed knows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I honestly, I mean, from my standpoint, when I talk to to women, is you know, I see where their headspace at and why are you here, what is it you want to achieve, you know, and what are you willing to do for it, and I don't sell it as a weight loss yeah. program. Yeah. Weight loss is a byproduct of yeah. everything. You know, once I get your gut going and your liver clean and, you know, we get your hormones functioning properly and you're eating, you're sleeping, you're exercising and you're taking time for self-care, that weight is going to come off like it's going to melt off Yeah. because your body now is functioning properly. It's dealing with the toxins, it's dealing with the proper nutrition you know, so I I don't like to um, address like, you know, oh, come and I'll help you. You know, yeah, the weight loss will happen, but don't come into it with, you know, I want to lose 10 pounds or 20 pounds or 30 pounds and be size six by the end of, you know, this, you know, because like I'm more interested in how much energy you're going to have, how well you're, you know, you're feeling as far as your digestion, if you're going every day, how well you're sleeping, you know, yeah. are you gone from four hours to now you're sleeping a solid seven, you know, uh, those are the things that are, in my opinion, a much better um, marker of good health than, you know, you keeping all, you know, not doing it and then all of a sudden dropping 25 pounds, but, you know, in 60, 90 days, going back to your same old habits right. and gaining it back and then some. And right. then saying, oh, you know, plant-based didn't work, <laughs> right. you know, and, and, you know, and that's the thing, you know, it's like, I don't expect you to go hundred percent plant-based initially, but the goal is to get you to be more plant-centered, you know, right. uh, by the end of our time together, because, you know, if anything, what I've learned since I've uh, adopted this um, lifestyle is how little fiber I was consuming you know, and the average person does consume maybe 15 grams is what they're saying. The average American, which I think is the same for Canadians, yeah. you know. So now that I'm in upwards of 50 to sometimes 80 a day, yeah. it's amazing. Like, <laughs> you know, I had serious constipation issues, you know, and I'm not afraid to say it. And I go, you know, maybe TMI, but you know what? <laughs> this is a sign of how unhealthy I was, you know, and, you know, so skin issues, you know, irritability, um, just fogginess, lack of sleep, all those can be right back to how well your, you know, your gut health is. Yeah. Everything goes right back to that. Did balance. you find that you had to gradually increase fiber in for yourself as well as other people? Sometimes people add in too much fiber. Too, too much right away. Yeah, yeah, and then they have other kinds of gut issues. They go from constipation to the other extreme. Now. Exactly, yeah. Because fiber is unhealthy because there's so much bad advice on fiber too. We, we, that, we get promulgated with that. I hear some people saying that you shouldn't have any fiber in your diet. And these are obviously quacks, morons. This is the problem. That there's that like, Everyone has a voice right now. So anyone yeah. can just deliver any kind of nonsense. And if they sound credible, because sometimes I talk to people about hormone stuff and they go, wow, you, you really know your stuff. And I go, yeah, I do, but you don't know if I know my stuff or not. You don't know enough to know if I know what I'm talking about. I may just sound like I know what I'm talking about. You know? yeah. So now if you sound like you know what you're talking about or you have a good physique, people put too much weight on that sometimes too. Like, yeah. oh, that looks great with your shirt off. He must know what he's doing. No, not necessarily. Yeah. Or the <laughs> DR in front of your name. You yeah. yeah, that's a big one too. And most that's a big don't one, right? That be honest, most doctors don't know jack about hormone optimization. Yeah. Give yeah. really bad advice. Men will go to a doctor and they'll have low testosterone and a doctor will say, well, you're in the normal range. So let's just, let's just wait until it gets worse before we do anything. Right. That's one extreme. Now the other extreme is it's low and they go, okay, let's put you on TRT. I had a guy email me the other day. He goes, my testosterone levels were low. My doctor says I need TRT. He sent me his blood work and I looked at it and he had low signaling hormones, luteinizing hormone and yeah. Stimulating hormone and low testosterone. I go, look, the only reason you would be a candidate for TRT is if you have really high signaling hormones and you still have low testosterone. Even then, there's things that can be done. But for the most part, that's someone who's a good candidate for TRT. 
this guy was in his early 40s. He's not a good candidate for TRT. Not yet. I mean, this can be this can be fixed. We can improve yeah. the signaling hormones and get your natural production way up. Yeah. Now, you want to keep your natural production as optimal for as long as possible. And then TRT is the last resort. It's not the first step, you know, in my opinion. So that that's the kind of advice. Now, in over here in Vegas, we have these TRT clinics that have popped up everywhere. Oh, and our really? TRT oh, clinic geez. is everyone who goes in there will qualify, you know, because that's how they make money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Then they're yeah. going to be put on, and I'm not against TRT. I know a lot of people who take TRT that's made a huge difference, but these are people that it wasn't the first thing they jumped on. They did everything as well as possible, and then they reached a certain age where they weren't getting the results they wanted anymore, and then it made sense. Okay, that makes sense to me, but someone who's 29 or 30 who has low testosterone, chances are it's because of poor diet, drinking too much, you're not sleeping. Why don't we address those things instead of just putting TRT right on top of it and then they don't change any of those lifestyle habits? Yeah. And that's just it, right? I mean, um, when I look at somebody who comes to me and I look at, you know, some some of them uh, give bring their uh, or send me their blood stuff. And I mean, I look at it and I think, OK, well, why don't we let's start addressing the core issues, you know, start with the gut start with your liver. Let's, let's start with nutrition. Let's do nutrition yeah. first, you know? And they're like, well, what supplements can I take? And yeah. I'm like, okay, let's just start with nutrition. You know, we'll go with that. And yes, you know, there are some, you know, if you're magnesium deficient or low, which most of us are, yes, I am all for that. Let's start with some magnesium, you know, vitamin D is another one, you know, especially for us ladies, you know, with, um, well, for everyone, but after, uh, if you're postmenopausal, our, you know, osteoporosis is such a high risk for us, right? So I have a friend who for years took calcium. The doctor just gave a calcium supplement, just take calcium. She's been diagnosed with osteoporosis. She comes to me, she says, oh my God, she says, I've been diagnosed. And I said, she says to me, but I've been taking calcium supplements that my doctor gave me. And then I said to her, well, what about your vitamin D levels? Have they checked that? She said, um, she got back to me. She goes, oh my God, they're so low. Yeah. He told me that I'm like, well, of course, you're not absorbing the calcium. You don't have any vitamin D, you know. So, you know, now she's but at this point, she's got osteo. Yes. So, you know, yeah. you it, it's it's that kind of thing where we just doctors are so quick to give prescriptions. And again, it goes back to the fact that a, a lot of them don't know about um, nutrition or haven't been taught a lot about nutrition and hormone optimization. But beyond that, it's the billable hours. Right. Yeah. So they can't sit with you for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour um, and discuss, you know, um, your lifestyle or your diet because they have a you know waiting room full of people that with conditions that they can write a prescription and bill. So it's, it's that, you know, double edged sword. Right. And I think that's where people like myself and nutritionists and dietitians come in that can fill in that gap. Yeah. Right. So your doctor and, and, you know, I have nothing against, you know, needing antibiotics or, you know, painkillers if you break your leg and all that. Like the, the reality is, that, you know, at some point in life, we do need these things. And thank God we have them. Yeah. But they shouldn't be the first kind of uh, line of defense. Yeah. We should always be looking at how we can optimize our own body's ability to produce these hormones, to fix ourselves with nutrition, with lifestyle changes, and just, you know, making those small changes sometimes is enough, you yeah. know, it, that you don't need, you know, those supplements, you don't need, you know, and yeah, there are the cases where you do need, um, you know, hormone replacement, for example, you know, I get that question a lot. What are your thoughts on hormone replacement? And I said, yeah, they have a place, but it's not the first thing that women should be given, right. you know, because a lot of times, it's not needed, you know. Um, PCOS, for example, is yeah. another one where young girls I have in my family, you know, um, one of my nieces. And, you know, it's, it's what, what's the first line of prescription she was given was the pill, you know, without any consideration to what the real underlying issues of PCOS are. Yeah. Uh, PC, yeah. So, anyway. That, that's the key right there. The underlying issues go on. So you're just covering up, you're improving numbers on a lab 
reports, but you're not addressing underlying issues. So you're yeah. giving yourself also the illusion that everything is addressed now. I think the flip side with doctors too is doctors get a bad rep for being too quick to prescribe medications. But the flip side to that is a lot of patients, that's what they want. Yes. So I know, I know doctors who try to talk to their patients about nutrition and all that, and the patient will just go, well, can't I just take a pill for this? Can't you yeah. just write me a pill? Or sometimes they'll give the option. They'll go, look, your cholesterol's through the roof. So you can either do these dietary changes or we can put you on a statin and then you can just keep doing what you're doing. We're like, well, I'll, I'll just take the statin. That way I can just keep eating my pancakes and yeah. <laughs> all the garbage. So yeah. that's the problem too. It's double-edged. On one hand, it's like you said, is you have the, the billable hours is there where the doctor sees a patient. You wait, in a, you wait for an hour to get 10 minutes of yeah. someone going through your lab work. That's one, that's one side of the equation. And the other side is this is what patients want. A lot of patients just want a pill rather than yeah. make lifestyle changes. And they, a lot of people think it's inevitable too. As you get older, you're going to be on medication. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's what you can do to lower your high blood pressure, or we can just give you a pill and you can just do nothing. Just keep doing what you're doing now. So the yeah. pill artificially lowers your blood pressure, but the cause of your blood pressure remains. It's still there. Absolutely. That's yeah. My latest one that I'm really frustrated with is Ozempic. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I had a gentleman reach out to me, um, you know, and said, you know, I've gained all this weight. Uh, I'm having hormone issues. I think I really need your help. So I said, Let, let's set up a time when we can chat, whatever. And I didn't hear back from him. And, uh, you know, he writes to me to say, oh, you know, um, I've decided my doctor has put me on Ozempic and I've started to lose weight. And it's just like, I said, oh, I said, um, you know, are you, um, you know, uh, diabetic? Uh, I didn't realize you were diabetic. Or he says, oh no, he says it's just because I'm gaining weight and I'm at risk of yeah. becoming diabetic. Yeah. I said, oh, I see. I said, so okay. I said, good luck to you. I said, you know, let me know how you do. Yeah. I mean, you know, Zempic works by improving insulin sensitivity, right? Isn't that the case for it? I mean, yeah. there's so many, there's so many nutrients that improve insulin sensitivity. Exactly. Let's say. Well, Beyond the diet, obviously a really good diet improves insulin sensitivity, but there's nutrients such as berberine and arlopoic acid and apple cider vinegar. These things improve insulin sensitivity as well at a fraction of the cost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and no side effects. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, those things aren't going to work either if someone doesn't change their diet. But yeah. I think Ozempic, if I'm not mistaken, shuts off appetite too. So people notice that they're yeah. not that. It's a, it's a suppressant, appetite suppressant. Yeah. Yeah. So I know several people on it, and uh, I know one individual who was on it for a while, lost a ton of weight. I'm talking 100 pounds. Wow. Uh, but went off of it, and back came the weight yeah. because nothing yeah. changed. <laughs> They're all Band-Aid solutions, and, you know, there's a million of them out there. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a challenge there. Let's talk about alcohol for a little bit, too, because... Alcohol, is there anything that's more negative for the liver than alcohol consumption <laughs> that you can think of? Not that I can think of, honestly. Uh, I mean, yeah. Besides, yeah, besides alcohol would have to be just a very high saturated fat diet that, you oh. know, um, high sugar processed foods. But even at that, I think alcohol trumps it. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what about what about re helping reverse the damage of alcohol? Is there anything you do beyond just improving the diet, sort of nutrients or anything like that that you look at? Nutrient-wise, I mean, uh, we start, like I said, diet first all the time. But nutrient-wise, milk thistle yeah, milk, um, right. is a really good one. Uh, bitter foods, I try to make sure they incorporate bitter foods because that's really good for the liver. Um, I'm a proponent of lemon water first thing yeah. in the morning. I do it for myself every single day religiously. I know there's some people that say it has no effect. I don't know. I mean, if there's any science behind it, but I believe there is. Um, I find I that enzymes generally improve from that. Yeah. That's, but yeah. that's my experience. Yeah. So, yeah, but generally, yeah, it's definitely, if not eliminating, cutting it back completely, right. uh, alcohol. Um, and then just, you know, the nutrition and then from a supplement standpoint is the milk thistle and bitter foods, you know, um, really find that uh, yeah. is what I, I recommend, you know, um, 
I think that's the key to telling someone to cut back because if you tell someone you can't have this anymore, what yeah. happens? Now it's forefront in their brain. Yeah. Now they want it more than ever. Yeah. Now they really oh. want it. You, get, you yeah. want to get to the point where you actually don't want it anymore. Exactly. I used to love drinking when I was a teenager, yeah. college. I used oh. to. Drink I used to love drinking. It was one of my yeah. favorite things to do. And if someone told me I had to give it up then, I would have said, forget it. I'll just yeah. I'll just make the trade off of living less yeah. and enjoying this more. But now I never I'm never really tempted for alcohol. I have all kinds of alcohol at the house that people have given as gifts. Some of these bottles have been here for 10 years. <laughs> because yeah. I'm not remotely tempted. I'll have a drink as a, a celebratory thing. You're out at a concert, you're out having a good time, sure. But it's not something I need daily. It's not some I probably have three drinks a year, if even that. And it's certainly not something I'm tempted by where I'm going, oh, man, I, I got to get rid of this vodka. Otherwise, I'm going to open it up today. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I think that's the key is but one guy asked me recently, he goes, well, what, what's the what's the cheat meal you have on your birthday? How you celebrate and all that? I go, look, I'm not a 12 year old child. I'll, I'll <laughs> eat whatever I want, whatever I want. See, yeah, that's the, yeah. it's, it's, it's not this high level of willpower I have. It's just that I simply yeah. don't want those things because once yeah. you're it gets calibrated and you feel really good and then you eat this garbage food you feel the negatives right away oh 100 percent. the current's right there going okay i'm not going to eat that again so i feel terrible yeah. energy is low for the day and my mood is off so so it's it's naturally you have these naturally it's, it's naturally repellent to you you don't want those yeah. things anymore exactly. i think the key with people is you want to get to the point where it's not something where you're trying to evade or people are firing shots and you're trying to evade it says they just they just go right by you without any temptation yeah. And that's just it, right? It's getting to that point. And again, it's that gradual making those changes, right? And like myself, like you, I used to enjoy alcohol a lot more than I do now. Do I have a glass of wine now and then? Absolutely. But it's not that, and if, it's not that I was an alcoholic, but it, you almost felt like you wanted that drink. You know, you had, you know, that need for, you know, oh, I'll have that margarita, or I'll have that, you know, uh, martini. But now it's like, do I want it? Yeah, I'm okay. I'll have a soda water with lime, please. Yeah. You know, and it, and I don't feel deprived. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, to get to that point is what, you know, whether it's with alcohol or with food, you know, different types of food, it's getting to that point. But people say to me all the time, don't you miss having steak and having eggs? And have, I said, I can sit and have a meal with anybody else. Like I'm the only, you know, plant-based person with the rest of and I have no desire to eat anything other than what, you know, I'm used to eating now. It's been six years and I feel great. You know, I can go to, I mean, I'll be 58 this year and I can go to the gym and do like a heavy for, for me, like, you know, heavy weights, um, you know, for 45 minutes. And I am totally fine the next day. Like I'm not, whereas before it would be two, three days of like complete soreness of like walking up the stairs was, oh my God, you know, like, yeah, I have soreness from my workout, but it's not that kind of like debilitating, yeah. you know, and I honestly attribute that to my diet, yeah. you know, low inflammation, right. you know, I right. feel well, like I was in this inflamed state and then you're just adding inflammation to it from the training. <laughs> Now you're in this low inflammation state going into your training. Exactly. That inflammatory you know, response to help you recover is going to be much lower than it was previously. Exactly. Yeah, that's so a big not only am I not, you know, um, having the, the crappy food, I'm not having the alcohol. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm now sleeping. So my body's recovering. So, you know, I used to, you know, not sleep very well, you know, like I used to, and you know, it was funny because I used to take it as a sign of, you know, oh, five hours that's all i need i don't need more than that you know almost like a, a badge of honor you know like yeah. i can go on you know very little sleep you know i'm superwoman but now like seven eight hours is delicious it's like when no. <laughs> yeah i said that to someone on the weekend yeah, actually yeah, sleeping yeah. it feels good it oh feels my good God. To get that in you feel you know, way and, more and the sign that your sleep is on point is you don't need an alarm clock yeah Definitely. Right. Yep. So years like I could not function without an alarm clock. I would sleep right through it because what would happen is like I'd fall asleep, wake up, spend four hours laying in bed doing one of these and fall asleep. Then, of course, when the alarm, you know, came time to waking up, it, the alarm would hit snooze, hit snooze, hit yeah. snooze because I was exhausted. Right now I hit the pillow. I sleep all night. I naturally wake up. I don't set an alarm. I'm up by 630 naturally, you know. 
and it feels great. It's like um, a rested, you, you're just ready to take on the day. Whereas before it was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. so it's, it's amazing. What yeah, I think that feeling is what makes temptation such as alcohol and comfort foods not tempting because why are people consuming those things? Because they want to feel better. Someone yeah. feels stressed, they have a glass of alcohol, now they feel less inhibited, they feel yeah. better, they're in a more festive mood. So they're always chasing that. Sometimes people's yeah. personalities are night and day between a couple drinks and sober. Yeah. But if you actually feel really good and you're in that positive state without any of that stuff, yeah. then why, why would you need it? Is that you don't need yeah. to feel better, you already feel better. You have the yeah, real exactly. thing here. you don't have the yeah. illusion. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's it's an amazing feeling when your body is just functioning as it should. And and getting there, you know, like I said, takes a while. It takes work. It's not an overnight thing. And it's continuous work, right. you know. Um, but it doesn't feel like work when it becomes, like you said, you feel good that it's just not like, I don't need to have that steak. I don't need to have that glass of wine. Do I want the glass of wine? I'll have it if I want, you know, but nine times out of 10, it's like, no, like, why, why would I do that? Yeah. You know, it's my body if I don't really want it. You know? Yeah. So. And then I think when you do have it occasionally, it's probably more impactful. It feels better because it's not something you have all the time. So it's something yeah. as a, but yeah. you have a drink every day. It's not special anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And also you'd almost like you lose that kind of um, taste for it. In yeah. fact, if that's even a word, because we were just on vacation, my husband ordered a mojito, and that used to be my drink. I loved mojitos. Those are good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and we apparently this place that we were at made the best mojitos in the world. So I said, oh, okay. let me have a sip. <laughs> well, I had a sip, and it was honestly, it was it it was good, but at the same time, it was like it was like rubbing alcohol, like yeah. And yeah. I used to drink these, like <laughs> you know. So it's just, yeah. See, I feel that way about foods that are really sweet because I have, I'm very sensitive to sugar from not consuming sugar often. To me, fruit is like a dessert. Yeah. That's naturally sweet to me. I know people who have blueberries, they have to put sugar on it because to them it tastes like chalk. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's naturally sweet. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes when I have these desserts, these vegan desserts, I mean, they're good, but they, to me, it's too sweet. It's super high. I mean, I can just have a bite and I'm like, okay, that's good. I don't need the yeah. rest of it. So I think no, people true. block that sensitivity to sugar to the point where you need these over-the-top experiences now to feel anything, to taste yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very true. Like my um, sweet indulgence is a bowl of frozen blueberries. Yeah. Like frozen blueberries for me is like having ice cream. Like yeah. I'm a, like a little kid and my husband looks at me and goes, <laughs> you light up like a little kid with a ice cream cone when you're having <laughs> frozen <laughs> berries. Those are good. Just, I love them, you know. So yeah, it's amazing how your taste buds change and just yeah. your your tolerance for sugar, uh, like added sugars, just goes. Like, yeah, crazy. that's the key I, word. For your taste buds change over time with healthy eating to the point where yeah. things that used to be irresistible are no longer even tempting. It's yeah. hard for people to imagine that in the early stages, but over time yeah. you actually over get time. It. Absolutely, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, like I said, I'm six years in, and yeah. It's, uh, it didn't happen overnight. It took six months to fully transition, but boy, um, it's, yeah, for me, it's been like godsend because, you know, yeah. I didn't go through, like I did in the beginning, go through all the, you know, the um, um, hot flashes and night sweats and all that, but I was able to make that change and nip it in the bud because my mom suffered with for like 10, 15 years. Oh. All those not like just awful, awful symptoms, oh. you know, and she still has like, you know, she's 78 and she still has issues, but it's all hormonal. And I tell her, mom, you need to get off your, that cheese. Like you just yeah. eat way too much cheese, you know, you, your dairy, like, yeah. But, you know, I mean, at 78, she tries yeah. with, you know, oh, well, I won't have it today, but then tomorrow she'll have to, <laughs> you know, so I just let it be. There's some things that are better left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People have a hard time making big changes at that age, too. I think a lot of times they feel, hey, I've made it this far. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, The what I get all the time is it's normal. Yeah. You know? uh, it's normal to feel, you know, achy. You're getting old. Right. You know? it, it's hard. And, I, and, you know, I say, mom, 
you know, there are people in this world that are like a hundred years old in yeah. these, you know, blue zones yeah. that are literally gardening. Right. Like they're right. getting up and they're literally gardening every day, doing walking, you know, yeah. cause I'll say to her, can, you know, why don't you go for a walk? Like just walk up and down the street for us, you know, a couple of times, you know, the weather here is starting to get nice and she says, oh, but my hips hurt, my knees hurt. I said, yeah, because you're sitting inside all day. Like just, right. you know, I'm not asking you to go at any specific uh, specific speed or distance. I said, just get that movement. I said, your joints need to get that. You know, I got her on some omegas now. And again, it's like, you know, the, well, why can't I have the fish? Like, you know, <laughs> and I try to explain to her, you know, with all the crap in our oceans. And, you know, I said, like, you're better off having this algae you know oil than you are having the yeah. so it's but you know like you said they've come this far and it, it's hard to make changes but it's not impossible and you know there's people of older age that have made changes but yeah, it's a mindset it's it's normal to feel this way what they're really saying is that everyone around them is in that same boat yeah. so it, so you're looking at the seven or eight people in your inner circle and, and all of you are at the same age and you all feel the same way so you're thinking okay this is normal now to transplant that person to people that are robustly healthy at the same age, that's, and now you're the only one talking about joint pain and brain fog, all of a sudden it's not normal anymore. Everyone around you is mentally sharp and still very vibrant. Yeah. Now it's not normal anymore. So that's, yeah. the, that's why it's it, who you hang around is also really important. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Your inner circle is so important. Well, what's that saying? It says, you know, if you hang around with four broke guys, you're guaranteed to be the fifth. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's true, yeah. right? So it's who we hang around with that makes a big difference. Yeah. Let's end with this. Let's let me get your recommendations on clearing out excess heavy metals. Is there anything in, because I remember you and I were going back and forth with this chocolate article I posted where all these chocolates that are that don't use child slave labor and that are fair trade and organic and dark chocolates, every check marks for everything that you would want in terms of the healthiest options, but it turns out a consumer reports report showed that they're super high in heavy metals. So obviously right. he is to cut those things out, but it's impossible not to be exposed to heavy metals in our diet, in our environment. So is there anything in particular that you take on a daily basis to just help mitigate those levels, help clear them out? I don't take anything in particular from a supplement standpoint, but I do make sure I have a lot of herbs in my diet, like uh, cilantro for one. And I know a lot of people don't, uh, you know, <laughs> like cilantro. They say it tastes like soap. So, um, you know, I make sure that in my diet, there's a, like, and I think fiber as a whole, you know, is a good detoxifier, you know. And if we keep our liver healthy by, you know, eating these foods that are high in fiber, that detoxify, like I said, our gut and our liver go work hand in hand. You can't have a healthy liver and an unhealthy gut, it would just never work or vice versa, right? So you have to, they work in tandem. So um, to get rid of not only excess and used up hormones and heavy metals in our diet and uh, in our environment and diet, um, we need to eat a, a more predominantly uh, fiber rich, diet so that we're eliminating, you know, because if we're recirculating all this stuff because of a poor digestion, then we've accomplished nothing, right? Yeah. So I think it's not just one thing because like I said, nothing exists in a vacuum. Right. Um, everything is a compilation of daily habits and things that we do. Um, so it's our diets, our lifestyles, our, you know, how, how much we exercise, how much water we drink, you know, that's another one. Uh, I find that a lot of people don't drink enough water um, you know, get rid of all like the sodas and all that. And then as far as that, uh, you know, uh, what I tell my ladies too, is look at your, um, you know, look at your makeup, look at your shampoo, um, yeah. look at what you're putting on your skin, because as women, you know, we dye our hair, we use nail polish, we, you know, put on makeup, we have uh, lotions, you know, all these things are a toxic load to our body and our liver, right? So um, we need to look at all those toxins as a whole, right? So um, if we look at all that, even, you know, our cookware and what we store our food in, you know, plastics and all that. So um, we have to become more conscientious of all the kind of extra toxins that we're bringing into our 
environment on a daily basis. I mean, there's things like you said, we can't control. I mean, the air we breathe, the water we drink, to some extent we have control, but you know, to unless we live in a bubble, yeah. you know, the water from the tap, we have to hope that it's, you know, somewhat good. You know, we can filter it to some degree, but there's still, I think, toxins in it. Our food, no matter how, you know, well and organic we think we're eating, you know, I honestly believe that it's just seeping in the soil. Like, you know, you can have a farm here that's organic, but the farm right next door isn't. So yeah. there's runoff, you know. Yeah. So are you really getting organic? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think Europe as a whole, it has better, more strict restrictions on, on that kind of stuff than yeah. North America. And we have a lot of catching up to do, right. you know, food food dyes and additives, you know, like emulsifiers, all those things, you know, are huge uh, toxins. Um, so it's not just heavy metals, I think that we need to concern ourselves with. It's the whole way our food and water and all that, that wherever we can mitigate, I think we need to really uh, be stringent, you know, like um, with regards to our lawns, for example, you know, uh, Roundup is a huge one that, you know, it's now illegal in Canada. I yeah. think you can still get it in the U.S. because yeah. I have friends that literally drive over the border to get it. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, um, so is having a, a nice lawn more important than, you know, your health because you're breathing that. If you have pets, you know, your pets are exposed to that. So it's it's all these things that accumulate. So where we have control and where we can, I say, you know, use nutrition, uh, eat a high fiber diet so that you had, at a minimum you're eliminating uh, as much as you can, drink lots of water so you're flushing um, and try to reduce the toxins, whether it's what you're ingesting by alcohol, you know, in your foods and yeah. So, uh, and, you know, I mean, supplement where it's needed. I'm, I'm not a, a proponent of, you know, just a multivitamin or this or that, you know, because those can also have additives and toxins yeah. in right? Yeah, well, so the problem also, with multivitamin also is that you may be getting too much of what you don't need and then you're getting too little of what you do need because a multivitamin is just a standard dose for everyone to take. And everyone, yeah. if you don't know what your vitamin mineral levels are, you don't really know yeah. what you yeah, exactly. So, you know, as, as a plant-based person, I take my B12, I do my omegas, um, I do take magnesium every night, yeah. um, you know, uh, my D3 and uh, for vitamin C um, that, you know, and my Bs, my B complex. Yeah. But yeah. other than that, I really don't, um, I'm not a proponent of a multivitamin. I feel, right. you know, get your nutrients in, make sure you have a balanced diet and, you know, and stop being so concerned with protein. God, please stop being so concerned with protein. You know, I'm sure you get that all the time. It's how do you build muscle on pro? Uh, you know, on your plant-based diet when you're not getting protein? I'm like, oh my god. I've yes. never found faster results with higher protein intake than moderate protein intake. In other words, one gram per kilo versus two grams per kilo. Yeah. I've done two grams per kilo before, and I, I didn't notice any. I didn't notice any negatives either, but I didn't notice any pluses. Yeah. Why yeah. bother? Why take more why if I'm not getting? Yeah, if I'm not getting a greater return, then why bother? And what people don't understand, and you know, and I have this kind of things with some people is like, you know, so you want all this protein, but are you working out? Yeah, exactly. Like lifting we, weight? Are you like, you know? So exactly. yeah, it's, protein is important as we get older, whatever. Yes, I get it, but you don't need to go above and beyond, you know. But you're getting there's protein in everything. Well, it's so, always sedentary people who seem most concerned about it too. Right? I don't think you need it for. You could probably cut your protein now in by seventy five percent, and it wouldn't make any difference. It would make a difference. You're not doing anything where you need those building blocks. Yeah. Would you think? Focus on your fiber because that's going to feed your microbiome, which is going to in yeah. turn, you know, get all those short chain fatty acids that are going to help your brain, your colon. You know, colon cancer. I don't know here in Canada has gone up by a ridiculous. Amount. I think it's one in four now being diagnosed with colon cancer. You know, so, you know, let's get the fiber in there. Let's get the gut healthy. Let's, you know, feed it what it needs so that we get that gut lining. Leaky gut is another one that's, you know, huge. I'm here you know, too. so why? Because our diet is just so deficient in fiber, not right. protein. Not, not <laughs> so, yeah, if I can, yeah, if I can just like leave it with one thing is like get your fiber in, 
work on getting at least 30 grams, do it gradually. Don't go for that triple bean salad, you know, day one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but gradually over time, build it up, build it up. So eventually you get to that 50, you know, 60, 80 grams a day. Yeah. And you're you know, going to the bathroom once, if not twice a day, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you're, you're actually flushing out any toxins, any excess hormones for a woman, especially, you know, the circulating estrogen. Let's get all that, you know, functioning properly, drink your water. And that's far more important than, you know, how much protein. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a great place to leave it. Where can people find out more about you? Obviously, I'm going to put all your info in the notes right below here or in the, the show notes. But is there a website that people can go to to yep. sign up for your services? Yeah, uh, websites live in la vida plant -based .com. Uh, Instagram is uh, at live in la vida plant -based. I'm on Facebook as well, same at live in la vida plant -based. And uh, yeah, if what they want to go through my website, I have uh, how to contact me, how to have a free consult, and yeah, we can chat and perfect. See where I can help. Awesome. Thank you. Well, this was great. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's a pleasure. You're super knowledgeable. So this was really, I really enjoyed this. Let me stop recording.